All right, good afternoon, everyone. Maybe for some of you, good morning. Well, Ludmilla, for you, it's especially good morning. Sorry if you jumped in in the middle of our conversation about Ludmilla's book. <laughs> All of a sudden, the countdown started. Um, but welcome, everyone, in today's webinar which is going to be uh, all about neuro-inclusive recruitment. And I'm very happy, Ludmilla and Tori, that you're here today again. And also super happy to see that, because I think, Ludmilla, you were in a webinar on neurodiversity in hmm, September, October last year, if I am not mistaken. That sounds uh, about right. Yeah, and Tori, I think we recorded a podcast about ADHD in January, if I'm also not mistaken, something like that. Um, and it's really great to see that. Uh, I don't know how that feels for you guys, but I have the feeling that neurodiversity is really taking off as a topic that at least is being discussed online. So I think that's uh, a good starting point. But before we dive into, um, into today's webinar, um, I'd love for you to first have a, a quick introduction of who you are and maybe also what links you to the topic of neurodiversity yourself. So I don't know, Ludmilla, if you would like to start. Sure, absolutely. I'm Ludmilla Praslova and uh, I'm professor of industrial organizational psychology at Vanguard, of Sa Vanguard University of Southern California. I've been in the field of diversity since I was 19 years old and that was a really long time ago. So I started in global diversity and then I worked in, you know, pretty much anything that you can think of, any kind of applications, but uh, for about the last four years, I was specifically focusing on neurodiversity because I finally discovered I was autistic. And, you know, the, the typical story, late diagnosed people misidentified with various other things their entire lives. But I think mm -hmm. I finally uh, figured out that there was nothing actually wrong with me. Perfectly good autistic brain. And uh, so I've been... Uh, just doing a lot of work specifically in this area for, yeah, since 2019. Great. I'm a big fan of all of, all of your blogs and uh, you have a book coming up. Uh, so I will definitely order it once it's ready. Um, Tori, would you like to uh, take over? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Tori. I um, have worked in recruitment for quite a while now <laughs> and kind of fell into the area of neurodiversity. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD um, coming up two years ago now and didn't really feel recognized or heard by any of the voices online of people with ADHD because I didn't, you know, identify with the more obvious characteristics, I guess. Um, so I kind of made it my mission to find that community and also um, find ways to make recruitment, which was, you know, my, my area of focus, more inclusive for uh, neurodivergent folks. Cool, thanks so much. And uh, I'm sorry, by the way, I just realized that I completely forgot to introduce myself as well. So I will be the, the last one <laughs> doing so. Um, so my name is Charlotte. I'm one of the founders of Equalture. Uh, we're an HR tech company based in the Netherlands. And uh, we are on a mission to shape the world of unbiased hiring. Uh, so we, well, short introduction, we built game-based assessments that are being introduced at the very start of the hiring process to hopefully help companies look beyond the resume a little bit more and focus on someone's real talent and opportunities there. Um, and basically guiding yourself by making use of scientific insights rather than gut feeling, because that's usually uh, not something to rely on in the hiring process or actually something that you should never rely upon. Um, a practical note before we dive into today's topic is that there is a chat functionality in the lower right corner of your screen. Um, there's also a questions tab next to that. So if you do have any questions for Ludmilla or Tori, feel free to drop them in the tab. And then I will try to uh, keep track of all the questions and make sure that they are being answered. The webinar will be between like 30 and 45 um, minutes. Having that said, we are going to discuss neuro-inclusive recruitment. Uh, what are maybe the issues with the way that most companies are recruiting nowadays? Um, what have you guys seen and how can we improve that? But before we dive into that, um, Ludmilla, can I ask you to give a brief definition or overview of what neurodiversity exactly is, just to make sure that we all have the same definition before we start? Sure. 
And it actually is a little bit complicated because people do use the term in multiple ways. Yeah. So if you look at the original definition when uh, Judy Singer talked about neurodiversity on the humanity level, it's the reality and the fact that people think in different ways, we feel in different ways, we process the world in different ways. But there is also a problem that not every way of thinking and uh, being and being in the world and world and perceiving the world has had equal opportunities or equal treatment. So some uh, types of thinkers and uh, humans have not had the same opportunities and the same kind of equality and society. So in the more narrow sense, we're also talking about neurodiversity movement, which is specifically to restore justice to specific neurominority groups that previously have been excluded or had to face additional barriers in the workplace. So a typical use would be to specifically refer to neurodiversity in the workplace as really helping uh, people from specific neurominority groups such as autistic, ADHD, people with Tourette's, and then we can also expand the definition to other neurominorities. Neuro but in general, it's to make organizations, workplaces, and you can talk education and so forth, more fair to some types of minds and to some kinds of humans because previously they have been disadvantaged by traditional processes. Yeah, thanks so much for the explanation there. And um, as I mentioned, I think, or at least I have the feeling that neurodiversity is really taking off, at least in the sense of that people are starting to talk about it, starting to educate themselves a little bit more on the topic. And that automatically, of course, brings you to, well, the recruitment process then as well. I think with all the forms of diversity, it's not really the good term, but you know what I mean? I think we started with gender diversity and then we, we broadened our horizon a little bit and neurodiversity has now become part of the equation. But usually when we are talking about diversity, at some point we have to take a critical look at the recruitment process because that's of course at least the starting point of making sure that you uh, get a diverse group of people in your company in the first place. Um, Tori, you are in recruit you're in the field of recruitment actively working yourself. Uh, so we have Luke Milla as an expert from the outside and we have you as um, an expert from the inside. How would you advise companies to even get started with assessing to what extent their recruitment process is neuro inclusive? Because that's quite a big, that's quite a big project and a big assignment for companies, of course, to take on. Yeah, it is a, a big project for sure. And I think when I um, kind of consider what we've done in my current company, um, it started with getting a neurodivergent lens on what it is that we're already doing. And, you know, fortunately that was me because <laughs> I, I'm in the team, it made sense. Um, and I was more than happy to try and evolve our process. But I think whether it is someone internally or you're, you're looking outside to um, a, a consultant that specializes in neuro inclusion, I think having that perspective um, from someone with the, the frame of reference that you're trying to improve the experience of, uh, is, is really important. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Tori, by the way, you're, uh, the, the sound that we discussed before now is without the AirPods. Like the, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of an echo kind of thing in there, but maybe if we switch back to the AirPods, then it's, uh, it works again. Um, <laughs> hey, Lula, seconds, if we, <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, if we look at the recruitment process, which is quite broad, of course, it starts with, um, well, maybe defining in the first place what you're looking for. Then we have job ads, we have screening, interviews, we have assessments that come in somewhere. Um, do you usually see that there is more that there are more pitfalls in one of those specific stages, or is it are there pitfalls in any of those stages throughout the entire funnel? There are pitfalls everywhere, and it might be working a little bit differently for specific neurodivergent groups, but there are definitely uh, pitfalls everywhere. It could be anything from how the person is uh, 
getting to your website where you have your materials. If it if it has all kinds of destructive, moving, supposedly pretty things, but uh, they really just kind of serve to distract people or pop-ups or just kind of unclear ways of navigating your website, that could be a turn-off. And then, of course, when you get to job descriptions, there could be so many different turn-offs because uh, people just put everything in the kitchen sink into their job descriptions and they're not specific and uh, then someone will look at it and not apply and I can definitely can come up with all kinds of examples where that actually happened when people did not apply and then if people actually do apply they navigate your website and uh, they kind of make sense out of your job application and there might be, wasn't too much jargon but they made sense out of it but then uh, the actual selection process can definitely have all kinds of issues and uh, we need to be sometimes a little bit more specific because again uh, we're talking about interviews as a really problematic practice in how it's organized and uh, just the tremendous way that this specific tool of the interview uh, has in selection process to the point where people basically use it synonymously with hiring and selection, even though it's just one tool. And in many cases, it ends up being a very bad tool, specifically for autistic people, but it can also be extremely stressful for uh, many other neurodivergent people. For autistic people, we do, however, know uh, that when people use thin slice judgments and their gut feelings and their intuitions, they just don't like autistic people. And research shows that when you look at the work produced by autistic people, so if you look at the substance, uh, the substance is excellent and ranked highly and the quality of work is outstanding. But when you look at style, uh, that that's where autistic people get dinged and that's why interviews are so problematic not just because they're stressful and often just don't make sense and autistic people don't even perform well uh, that may not even necessarily apply to everyone some people can actually perform quite well but there's still this um you know, we talk about the dual empathy problem and that uh, neurotypical people uh, don't just like intuitively connect with autistic people. And um, because obviously most interviewers are not autistic, that significantly uh, reduces chances of getting jobs. And then we can talk about other things like dyslexic people and some applications that for some reason require, you know, writing exam, even though it has nothing to do with the actual job. So for the most part, again, even interviews can make sense if your job is answering random questions all day long while smiling, right? If not, <laughs> just use whatever it is that actually measures your job. And very often when we get specifically to selection process, we over rely on interviews, even though for most people, they have very little correspondence with the actual job duties of the individual. And then we over rely on other things that are not necessarily most valid. So the question is really not so much about neurodivergent people being tripped up, but basically, qualified people being tripped up by a process that isn't valid and that isn't measuring what it is supposed to measure. No, that I, I, I fully agree. And I think there's, um, well, we are, we, for some reason, the, the, the interview is still sort of the holy grail for companies. I think it's also because it gives us the feeling of we were in the room or virtually, of course, nowadays, but uh, I think it gives a feeling of control. I think, Tori, when we recorded the podcast about ADHD together, we also spoke about the interview. Uh, and that you also didn't necessarily like the interview process yourself, right? <laughs> we can't see you. We can't hear you yet. Uh, but it also says that you're on mute. <laughs> this is always the magic of uh, live webinars. Uh, sometimes, Satori, if you refresh and then come in the link again, uh, then it could work uh, again. 
or what leads uh, that helps me most of the time. Um, hey, meanwhile, then uh, while we are waiting for Tori to get back, Ludmila, it's because I so as I said, I fully agree with you. I think that a lot of companies put too much emphasis on the interview. I hold my I will hold my question uh, because I see that Tori unmuted herself uh, as a follow up question on that. <laughs> Uh, Tori, what has been your experience with a job interview? Being in there yourself, not necessarily doing the interview. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, from the perspective of me as, as the recruiter, um, the experience that I've seen other neurodivergent folks experience is that, you know, in the past I've been asked um, to make reasonable accommodations for someone to prepare for an interview in terms of supporting them with giving them the questions ahead of the interview to, to alleviate some of the anxiety going into what is a really weird structured environment that they're not likely to be in as, as part of the role and the, the challenges that come with um, interviewers not understanding that and then I guess from the other side as a candidate and I've got limited experience of knowing I've had ADHD and being a candidate right um, is that it's really tricky to do the right things in the interview I don't know if anyone will have noticed I'm probably calling it out and making it really obvious now but I'm struggling to look in in the camera for this because it feels unnatural to me and that's symptomatic of my ADHD uh, and so you know I've I know that I would be at a disadvantage for those those small things because an interviewer might perceive that as me being distracted or disengaged and therefore not really interested in the job and there's so much misunderstanding um when it comes to to the purpose of an interview and you know what success looks like uh in an interview so is it fair to assume that maybe i'm making it too black and white uh but after hearing both of your opinions is it a fair summary that or assumption that the job interview might be the most painful step in the process when it comes to neuro inclusion and recruitment or am i uh, drawing conclusion a bit too fast it's it's very tempting to say that and actually when i was preparing for it one of my thoughts was just ban the interviews because <laughs> really bad and the word is typically used incorrectly anyway and then try to find something without the interview but there are many other people for example who find all those endless web forms extremely painful because a they're extremely long they're they all for some reason require entering and re-entering the same information over and over again and then someone is applying for multiple jobs and uh, people are for some reason can't coordinate so you hope you very often have to fill out the same lengthy and frustrating form over and over and over and over again and then it's like dice on you and kicks you out and you have to do it over again so that is a lot of frustration as well for many neurodivergent people but as far as decision making the actual discriminatory decision making a lot of that does occur to the interview due to human biases and similar to me phenomenon because a really a lot of hiring managers are just on the gut level and pop psychology they can say whatever they want but really they're just looking on the gut level for someone who's similar to them yeah but it's also difficult then right because um I think we touched upon this uh, as well, Ludmilla, in the last webinar that we had, which was a little bit more focused on autism also specifically, that it's it's so difficult to shape a hiring process that is inclusive for everyone, because one person might not prefer the interview, another maybe doesn't like to be behind a computer or read a lot or type a lot, or if you maybe it's a uh, this question is too difficult then for you to answer i will leave it up to you who's going to answer it and if there's no answer that's also fine uh but if we would have to pick then the most ideal process that is never going to be ideal for everyone but at least comes close to being ideal for the majority what would your recommendation then be for the recruiting process and maybe specifically the process from 
I hit the apply button up until the moment that I received my contract. It's actually not that difficult in essence because preferences are preferences, but organizations also want to hire the person that is the right person for the job. So you need to define the job and you need to do whatever is valid for predating success at this job. So the problem with the process, frustrating is one thing and like unpleasant is, uh, is a, a separate issue. But the major issue with the process is that it's not valid. And we do know that failure rate is very high for new hires. So people are asking for something that's not actually what they need. And then they try to select for something that they don't even know what it is with imperfect methods. And then we end up with, you know, hires that don't perform and people who are not hired, but they would have been incredible. So what we really need is basically as one of the elements of my model is valid valid hiring so you need to go back to the basics do job analysis so that you actually know what kind of skills you need and then measure those skills in whatever way the best resemble or resembles the actual work and the actual output and let's say my job is to provide highly accurate technical reports okay so well, first of all, you probably don't need me to be an amazing public speaker because um, that's doesn't really is not relevant to this particular job. But you need to assess my ability to write technical reports, whether I like it or not. So give me a job sample, give me a task that resembles the actual task that I need to be doing at this job. That's a core identified. A major part of what I'm supposed to be doing and let me let me give you a small sample now I'm not a fan of those like three month unpaid things <laughs> where people just work for free for organizations but give me a short snippet of what I actually am supposed to be doing and uh, that people are not going to complain about it because that is what you're actually supposed to be doing and then look at the outcome and you may not necessarily say that, uh, like, I should be able to walk them through my work. They obviously need to be able to check if it's actually my work. But beyond that, just let me do it in my own way. And my thinking process might be a little bit different than someone else's thinking process. But if I can demonstrate that I can produce the outcome, the job, is looking for and I can perform core tasks or I demonstrate ability that's been demonstrated by research to be highly related to this uh, particular performance, then we're good. And so it's really not about what I like. It's about measuring what you are supposed to be measuring for this particular job. I'm not going to qualify for every job, but for jobs that I am qualified for, give me ways to demonstrate it in the ways that actually are valid for this particular position. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Tori, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, for sure. It's something that um, I'm actually working on at the moment, which is looking at um, right at the beginning at the job description stage, like Ludmila said earlier, um, you know, it's just this long list of Wish, wishes and hopes for what this person can bring and then you know you do quite often see people go back out and look for a new role because it's not what they were expecting right and so we're currently undergoing a process where we're looking at our skills profiles that we have for each role and figuring out how we can kind of make that into our job description so there's that level of consistency an individual knows what to expect right from that point of application to, to hopefully joining us um and I don't think there is ever going to be a, a one-size-fits-all recruitment approach. It's about a much wider conversation with your interviewers, your hiring managers. Sorry, is my sound gone funny again? I can hear myself. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. You, I did not want to distract you in the middle of your answer. <laughs> but it's fine. I can't. It's always I can the way. Um, hopefully, it's okay. 
Yeah, I can I can hear what you're saying. Ludmila, can you hear what Tori is saying? Yeah, it's yeah, okay. uh, it's kind of static you, but you can still hear what you're saying. Cool. Um, <laughs> no worries, no yeah, worries. So it's about educating um, your interviewers and hiring managers to understand what accommodations are reasonable and fair and how to um, fairly assess a candidate who's received accommodations versus um, maybe a neurotypical candidate who hasn't required any adjustments as part of that interview process to make sure that you are making the best hire for the role. Um, yeah, that was it really. So uh, if I um, uh, if I try to summarize like both of your uh, views into one, then basically what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, whereas maybe most people would start, I think I even literally said it to you, like let's assume that we start from someone hits the apply button up until the moment that someone gets an offer. But the problem is actually way before someone hits the apply button. So if we would, carefully analyze what do you need in order to get the job and assess whether every step of the process contributes to finding it out or hinders you from finding it out. We could basically assess, okay, these are the steps that will help us and these are the steps that might not be helpful. Is that the fair summary of the situation? Perfect. <laughs> um, before we dive into um, uh, some questions that people might still have, if you would both have to, uh, I'm sorry, I did not communicate this question with you up front. Uh, so if you don't have an answer, that's fine, of course. But I get curious when we were talking about it. Uh, and you both know me by now. I'm not so good at sticking to the script. Um, if, could you both give an example of one thing that you've seen in the recruitment process in the past of which you thought like, oof, that's something that you should really stop doing right away? And something of which you thought a best practice, like, well, I've, I haven't seen this before, but this is actually a huge help from a narrow inclusion point of view. Who wants to start? I'll start. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to harp on the interviews a little bit more because the <laughs> psychology just needs to start and people thinking that eye contact like Tori mentioned and handshake and how you smile and where you look that all of those things are actually predictive of something that makes sense it is it, just bad 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 assumption and people say oh i can tell the liar and there's like how do you tell a liar you will never tell a good liar in an interview a good liar is a good liar for a reason you're going to catch a bunch of nervous people who are as honest as they can be so don't try because research shows that humans just all, all those cues that are supposed to point to lying they're actually cues to honest neurodivergent behavior and uh, the good liar is not going to be caught by those pop psychology things so just measure actual outcomes and job performance and don't think that you can just intuit who is going to be uh, the right person during the interview. And then one thing that I've heard from, not from employers, because employers can tell you like, yeah, of course, our uh, process is amazing, but something that I've heard from employees that they really enjoyed, and uh, that was from Deloitte. Uh, people who have gone through their neurodiversity hiring and they work with specialists and but then uh, they also kind of work on it on their side and tweak it with their side so they had a program that was kind of lengthy but effective and uh, they uh, hired people and then they allowed those people to redesign the program to be even better so I think that level of participation is an excellent practice. So you ask neurodivergent people in your neurodiversity hiring program how to make it better. This constant process of self-improvement, I'm in general just a big fan of continuous improvement. Uh, that is something how you do thing, things. So A, they made a program better, but B, they have a process to keep making it better with more and more feedback and continuous fine tuning. So that is something I think organizations need to strive for because we're not perfect. Our organizations are not perfect. But if we have enough open mindedness and the self-critical approach that we can continuously improve, we're really on our way. 
I couldn't agree more. I always find it so um, interesting. Let's let's uh, use the word interesting for it. That oftentimes when we are talking about HR or recruitment related challenges, we tend to sit together in a boardroom with HR and recruitment and C level, trying to find a solution for the problem. And I'm always like, but like your it's your team. Like use the feedback from your team if after the hiring process, after you rejected someone, maybe in the interview process, but also, for example, after um, an onboarding process, like what did you think of it? Could we do it better than um, what are your points of improvement? I think that there's so much hidden value in just starting to ask your colleagues about feedback. So I think you made a very valid point there. Um, Tori, any uh, do's and don'ts that you'd like to add? Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of similar in the sense that, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges when trying to create a more neuroinclusive inclusive uh, recruitment process is ensuring that you've got that buy in internally, that people understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And, you know, I, I spoke to someone who um, mentioned that their company was trying to improve their neuro inclusion uh, within recruitment. Um, and actually what they'd seen was that because people didn't get it, they actually almost ended up with like a quota of neurodivergent individuals that they wanted to hire and it's really really difficult to hear that, that things like that are happening and so I guess it's around having the conversation and understanding the skills and strengths that neurodivergent folks can bring to an organization and championing those versus just trying to have neurodivergent people in your business because it's the, the, the right thing to do. Sorry, now I can unmute for a second. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, but for, uh, also a really fair point. I think that's that's with everything related to DEI. I think it starts with properly educating yourself. Uh, and and let's and I think there are inclusion or at least well, let's admit it for myself. It's a rel for it's for me also a relatively new topic. It's something that I started looking into. I think over the last three to four years, maybe that is really being taken off a little bit. So. It's, it's okay, of course, to not be fully educated already if you just want to uh, want to get educated. Um, hey, I got one question from Lisa, uh, and I'm sorry, Lisa, I uh, overlooked your question, so I didn't see it when you uh, already asked it. But Lisa asked, um, basically, uh, would you recommend any accommodations after the interview is over? So more the follow up of the interview. I think, Tori, we touched upon this as well in our podcast episode, but I'm not sure anymore. Yeah, I think it, it very much depends on the individual. And to jump around a little bit, as part of your application process, it's really important to pick, to make people feel that they can be open and honest about their neurodivergent status. Um, and so that, you know, you can support them right from the, the, the get go in terms of what it is they need, how you can better uh, support them through the process. And it's better to be candidate led in my experience, because some everyone experiences neurodivergence differently. And so if you can understand if a person will benefit from uh, feedback being delivered in a certain kind of way or any kind of aftercare following the interviews, um, then it, it's best to do as much as you can in in that case, um, but I don't think there's going to be a blanket um, way of providing accommodations. Anything, Ludmilla, you'd like to add to that? I agree. It's definitely something that depends on individual specific needs. Sometimes you just need little something to get through uh, the hiring process and the job is such an amazing feat that you don't even need accommodations. In most cases, people might need just very slight adjustments. And uh, again, the best practice is just to give people whatever they need to do their job uh, to the best of their possible ability. And sometimes when you have really good work organization, you may not need accommodations or they could be minimum, minimal. And uh, in some cases, people do require uh, or whatever adjustments make them more effective. So you definitely uh, need to continue it as a good practice, whether it's a pre-hire or ensuring success. The way I talk about it in my book, it's the access 
part and sometimes you need to help people to demonstrate uh, their best ability and then success part and then obviously if you hired someone you want to enable them to be as successful as possible and if uh, that involves some kind of adjustments then it's really in everybody's best interest as well so you don't just like do this huge favor to the person that they need to beg for and plead and bring you, you know, reams of doctor's notices. It actually makes sense for your organizational productivity to help people be as productive as they can be. Absolutely. Hey, that brings me to uh, my last question, uh, because I already mentioned it for a couple of minutes before. Uh, I think uh it still requires some education for a lot of people to uh really get their heads around their inclusion their diversity would you have any recommendations of uh, well i know Ludmilla, that you write amazing blogs by the way for hbr if i'm not mistaken uh we are going to make sure to include them in the recap uh, of the webinar as well but do you specifically recommend any uh, websites books um courses uh, that you've seen being successful to educate yourself on this topic okay there's definitely a lot of, i would say you know wait for my book because it's going to be amazing yeah yeah I, I, crystal actually asked what the title what the title of your book is going to be but i think you <laughs> can't reveal that yes right tentative. it's still tentative it could be the canary code which i have a couple of articles and um hbr and and fast company kind of giving you the the general overview and all of it is linked to my linkedin profile by the way so if you just find my linkedin profile um, a lot of it is just linked under jobs by by the publication if it's an hbr if it's in fast company or if it's on specialist and it's going to be linked there but uh then obviously there are various organizations and uh, groups and consultants who can help people tailor something so it's one thing to just um, get ideas that are published and even though my canary code model is pretty flexible because i focus on principles like validity or transparency or participation that could be applied across different situations sometimes you would want to work uh, with people who preferably have both organizational experience and lived experience uh, to help you with tailoring those things to your specific organizational needs and i also do know that uh, equalture has all kinds of uh, links and uh, ideas on uh, the website as well so there are many organizations that can help you with it and uh, again you can definitely check uh, check out things on my profile there's a little bit we're starting to put under ascend talent but it's a pretty new one but we have been putting some things under there but again uh, try to find someone who really understands your industry, your population, and specific type of neurodivergence if you want a tailored solution because it's not necessarily uh, the off-the-shelf solution that is going to work for you. But also just if you embed the principles that I'm talking about in the canary code, such as, again, flexibility, transparency, valid measurement, it is going to be really helpful because you can just say, OK, so in evaluating my selection process, where do those principles come in? How do I need bring in participation from people? How do I make it valid? Then if you look at your promotion process, again, how do I make it valid? How do I make it transparent? Uh, who do I need to uh, talk to to understand why maybe some people in our organization uh, have barriers to promotion based on whatever it is, their gender, their, their neurodivergence or any other characteristics. So uh, when you start thinking about ask people, be transparent and use valid measurement and um, look at the outcomes rather than, you know, styles and personality characteristics, you are going to build, build a better processes. Thanks so much for that. And um, sorry, by the way, while I ask you the question, uh, my lovely colleague Kat let me know that we actually published a very cool article of you 
yesterday already on our website uh, with a whole list of uh, recommended books and articles. So I put, I put it in the chat, by the way, uh, um, for everyone to check it out. Um, Tori, before we wrap up, any last words for you? Things we didn't touch upon yet of which you think, hey, I really should say that still in this webinar. Um, nothing particular, but I guess um, from your last question around, you know, suggestions for people to kind of educate themselves. Uh, I feel like I should be on commission because I make everyone I know read it. Um, the Divergent Mind um, by Janira Nirenberg. Um, it's very specific to the female neurodivergent experience, but it can be applied um, more broadly. Uh, but I think it was really eye-opening for me um, to, to learn about ADHD and neurodivergence more broadly. It's something that, like I say, I make everyone <laughs> that I work with read. Um, and I've been told that, you know, it's really helpful for them to get some perspective on what it's like to, to be neurodivergent. Um, and that empathy really kind of supports in, in building their own inclusive processes. Great. Yeah, and I see that it's uh, it's the first book, I think, on your list in the article. So I'm meanwhile looking at the article that you wrote on our website. So uh, definitely worth checking it out. I actually ordered the book myself last week as well. So I still have to uh, start reading it, but I will let you know what I think of it uh, after I finish. Um, and we are um, at the end of today's webinar. Some shameless uh, self-promotion at the end of it. I also published, a, put a link in the chat to um, an event that we are going to host with eCulture on the 11th of May. It is an offline event though in Amsterdam, so I can understand that it's not for everyone doable, but there is a keynote on neurodiversity recruitment. Uh, so it might be worth checking out if you are in, uh, happen to be in Amsterdam that day. Um, having that said, Tori and Ludmilla, uh, thanks so much for being here uh, today with us uh, for the second time, for the both of you. Very much appreciated. I think we uh, still have a lot to do to make people more aware of neuroinclusion. Um, for everyone who has joined today's webinar, thanks so much for being here. If you do have any questions for Ludmilla or Tori, I know that they're both very active on LinkedIn, so I think you can, uh, you can reach out over there. Uh, and I hope to see you back on one of our webinars. And Tori and Admira, once again, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting us and thank you, thank you. to everyone who was here. Cool. And have a great rest of your day. Ciao. You too. Take care.